we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and as folks join in, and as we said, we'll go ahead and make, and make this recording available to folks. Um, so we know, as I said, it's a busy news day. Um, so my name is Andre Nata. Um, I currently serve as the collaborations editor here at Mutt Rock. And Michael and Sonia, if you want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, um, I'm Sunyan. I'm the new open source fellow uh, with Document Cloud here. Um, previous to working at Muckrock Foundation slash Document Cloud, um, I work with a nonprofit called Lucy Parsons Labs, where I was a community organizing chair there. Um, worked on a lot of different FOIA research uh, projects, and I considered myself a Document Cloud power user before that. But there's so much more that I didn't even know about. And, uh, I hope we can unravel some of that stuff with you today as well. I'm Michael Morrissey. I'm the co-founder of Muckrock and, and really excited to be chatting about um, the work that we've been doing so that hopefully it makes the work that you're doing a little bit easier and more impactful. Oh, and we'll go ahead and jump right in and um, we might let others from the team introduce themselves in the chat as they appear later on. Um, but to get started, um, the reason that we're doing this is because a lot of new and great additions have been made to, to Document Cloud here in the last year. Um, and it's a bit, and you all as power users and fans of the platform that played a big role in that. Um, we went ahead and been talking to folks for the better part of the last year about the needs within the Rock and Document Cloud communities. And among those were figuring out ways to sort through large releases of files. Say, for instance, if there's a congressional hearing going on and you have to be on another meeting, and then you see the documents get released, how would you sort through those in a timely fashion? Um, how do you turn those documents into data, um, including PDFs that aren't necessarily OCR compliant? And, and how do you get access to that and then make those usable, usable and, 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 um, and turn those into spreadsheets and make them uh more malleable um, and then how do you find ways to go ahead and monitor agencies and get alerts for when new documents are made available to you um, so this new catalog of add-ons was designed to address that um, figuring out ways to create a flexible way to go ahead and create options that allow you to do all of that work that needs to be done within the platform. So in essence, we are providing you more products within the Document Cloud platform and allow you to go and address most of these things, especially as many of us on this call are in the journalism profession on deadline, which has become tighter and tighter as time has gone on, um, and allow you to go ahead and build on the add-on as you see fit, if you see things that are, that are different gaps in that platform. Um, and so it allows you to go ahead and it allows us to go ahead and figure out ways to best serve you, but it also allows you to go ahead and see how best you can go ahead and continue to contribute to the Document Cloud community and, um, and then share it with everybody and see what, and see what we're able to go ahead and, and discover as a result. Um, it's a really good opportunity. I'm just, I'm excited because it's, it's a chance to go ahead and serve large and small newsrooms, individuals, everybody um, from, this, from this catalog. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Sunny in order to demo a couple of um, a couple of, of the initial add-ons that have been released as well as give you a, an idea of what's being worked on on the beta side and talk about where this could go next. And I, and while I'm doing that, I will also give you permission to share your screen. Thank you, thank you. Give me one second while I pull up on my end. I'll probably have to turn camera off. Let's see if both will work, we'll see. Mm -hmm. 
Can you all see my screen? Yes. Awesome, great. I feel like that never happens the first time around. <laughs> um, always prepare for the worst case scenario, right? Um, so yeah, a lot of people are unfamiliar with the add-ons interface as is. Um, I mean, just a basic rundown. You find add-ons um, on the first tab menu here, um, and then you click on add-ons. And if you've never used an add-on uh, previously, you'll have to go to browse all add-ons where you can actually see the uh, entire listing of available add-ons. Um, I've already run add-ons in the past, so it'll show which ones I have activated. Um, a couple different ones that uh, I'd like to run through with you all today. Um, Michael, did you have one that, in particular that you wanted me to start with, or can I just uh, hop in? Yeah, hop in. I think uh, bad redactions and the um, the the scraper tool are two two very useful ones. So I think those are good to talk on. But totally. Let me actually activate the scraper tool because I had activated it before. There we go. Great. Um, we can go ahead and do bad redactions. Um, one second. So bad redactions. Um, basically uses a x-ray library in the background uh, to kind of identify where agencies might have used uh, poor redaction tools uh, and or if they've only partially redacted a um, piece of speech. I've used this in the past, for example, on police documents. If they don't uh, fully cover up the letters in the redaction, uh, the tool will likely be able to pick out the character based on like what encodings is being used. If the OCR is pretty good, um, it'll be able to detect like the difference between the number two and the number five or the letter T or the letter Y, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, you can select a uh, particular document. Um, I'm just going to run one blind in this case. We'll see um, how it does on a, an untested one in this case. Um, and then it gives you the option to actually redact, um, the redact, the bad redactions. Um, this is useful in the case of like, if you're, if you've done redactions using your own software in the past and it has personally identifying information, for example, um, and it's able to identify that, Hey, that redaction is poor. Um, you can actually use document clouds built-in redaction, uh, tool to, cover that up as well. Um, I find that pretty useful in some use cases. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run this add-on on, on this particular document. And what'll happen is it'll start off in the queue. Um, once it gets pulled up, um, it'll start, it'll show in progress, and then it'll give you a, a success or a, a failure notice. And if it's uh, successful in this case, it'll uh, display to you a CSV file where um, it'll link to um, the pages and the redacted information, um, and it will try to unmask what that particular um, bad redaction is. And I'll show you here. It was able to, to find two. Let's see what's going on here. Page number eight. Looks like it was able to decode two different letters that were not redacted completely. So if I look into that document, <laughs> probably the uh, C and E here under reporting officer's signature, that probably wasn't even intended to be redacted in the first place. Uh, however, since it was partially redacted, the bad redactions uh, add-on was able to detect that that was a C and an E um, on page eight of this document. Um, on other documents, uh, you can actually like pick out whole word. Uh, the the add-on will actually be able to pick out whole words. Uh, Michael, did you have a particular um, document that you wanted to run this against? Yeah, if you, uh, I'll just drop in chat, but uh, this works really okay. well. Uh, there was, uh, Paul Manafort in one of his earlier legal filings, um, his lawyers didn't properly redact almost anything. And so uh, <laughs> you can kind of pull that out. It also kind of looks to see sort of like, did somebody just kind of put a black square above the text? And then it knows that that information <laughs> is probably particularly of, of interest. Um, and one of the things it also does is it'll highlight with an a private annotation where those redactions are 
within the document so you can kind of quickly see um, exactly where to look for that that text once it's done running. Totally. Let's uh, run through that and uh, analyze the results for that one real quick too. Um, while that's running, um, I kind of wanted to run through um, another um, add-on that I found particularly useful um, is the summarize add-on. Um, in this particular use case, um, let's say I have um, dozens of documents that I'm not necessarily able to read um, or I don't have the time to read, right? Um, in particular, I'm going to do, I know this person has a lot of documents. And I've run this on here. Okay, this add-on finished. So let's see the results there first. And then I'll hop into the summarize add-on. So this one was able to identify several di different documents. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, it, it's able to locate it on the specific page, um, the page number, the document ID, and what the underlying text is. Um, in this case, it has like whole phrases that were poorly redacted. Um, pretty cool. Um, I could see a lot of different use cases for this. Um, not so sure, I haven't tested this. Um, I don't know, Michael, if you can speak to this. I haven't tested this on documents that are handwritten or like if it used like a black Sharpie or something like that. Um, but I know it's worked well on um, uh, like poor software-based uh, redaction systems. I don't know if you have anything uh, more to say about that one. Yeah, I think it mostly just looks for, is there something that's, is there OCR text underneath sort of either a black box or a white area? Um, and so yeah. it can worry, depending on if, if it was previously OCR, it can detect that. Um, it just kind of mostly depends on sort of how the redaction was applied. Totally. Uh, so this is a 57 page document um, that the Illinois Department of uh, Corrections sent to the author, the Office of Attorney General. Um, it's a fiscal report basically, um, has a lot of, uh, legalese in it. Um, but I've run the summarize add on on this one in the past. Um, I'm going to run IDOC OAG. It's going to, um, basically use a natural, uh, language processing, um, tool, uh, to pick out what it thinks are significant keywords in the document. And then therefore, develop weights around specific sentences. Um, and it's going to graph that based on importance. Um, and then from that, it's going to try to formulate a coherent summarization of the entire document. Um, we'll let this run and I'll show you the results of this, which I actually found to be pretty impressive for like for the model that it is. Um, I could see this use case being really um, important for small um, journalism teams that don't have the resources or man hours or um, you know, money to be able to read through each individual document that they get from, let's say, a FOIA response. Um, so they might want to pick through and see, using the summarize tool, um, see which documents that might be pertinent. Uh, this one goes really well, uh, hand in hand, um, with the GPT-3 Playground um, add-on as well. Um, I won't be demoing that one right now, but what that one uh, allows you to do, Michael, if you wanna explain it a little bit, um, I'm gonna just give like a basic overview. It's gonna use uh, a form of artificial intelligence to kind of, uh, you give it a key term, um, basically something you're trying to research, and it's going to try to determine and evaluate whether or not that document or set of documents is relevant for, to your investigation. And based on the type of document that it is, whether it be an email, a memo, um, a government report, a spreadsheet, so on and so forth, it's going to try to determine uh, like it's newsworthy, newsworthiness. Um, Michael, if you have something more to say about GPT-3, feel free while this summarized add-on uh, runs through. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that we've been working a lot on is sort of finding ways to make it easier to integrate Doctrine Cloud with, with third-party APIs and including things like improved OCR. But one of the most exciting has been um, being able to kind of use GPT so that it's not just, you know, you can get it to do some fairly um, 
fairly advanced tasks, such as review this letter, summarize it, tell me if it's a memo or an email, and um, you know, tell me, you know, total up all the the costs that are outlined in this document, um, and then you know, uh, tweak that into the document cloud interface and um, use that to help guide your your reporting. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to take a moment to go ahead and get a couple of these answers to questions read into the recording. So that way, people can go ahead and take full advantage of the knowledge. Totally happy to take attention to the, the chat. Thank you, Andre, for um, stopping here real quick before I show. Luckily, I ran the summarization add-on before the demo. So even if it stalls in progress or something like that, I have the actual results that I can show you as well. So uh, speaking so, so speaking of the summarization add-on, is it uh, Michael's already answered this in the chat, but if somebody could say, is the summarization add-on extractive or abstractive? Michael, do you want to expand a, on do you want to expand on, on the answer that you gave in the chat of it being extractive? Uh, I will do my best, although this is a little bit of I don't want to get too deep into the, the technicalities of it because then I'll start mangling things. But uh, with this summarization add-on, we wanted to kind of identify the three most, I think it's three most important sentences, um, three to depending on sort of the length of the document. And so it is pulling right from the document. So you're not worried about it um, kind of uh, making something up. It is just kind of identifying what are the key sentences. And so it's extractive rather than trying to... Um, you know, kind of do sort of a natural language summary of a document. Thank you very much, sir. And then for the other question in here, and then we'll go back and answer some general questions towards the end, because there are a couple in there. Um, for this particular, for this particular add-on again, um, does it use or ignore text in forms? Um, it should include text in forms because it should be any of the text extracted from a given document. Um, Correct. If it's if it's uh, OCR, um, if Correct. it isn't, of course, that's not going to be included in the the data set that's provided to the natural language uh, language processor. Um, that's all I have for right now. So I'll throw it back to you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, this is the results for the summarization add-on. Um, it basically lists the most important person in the document, Jared Brunk, who's actually basically. What this document, the gist of it is, is uh, the Illinois Department of Corrections has been like fiscally irresponsible for years and years, and um, they are having to fill out these audits every year and showing that they're making uh, progress towards their fiscal goals with the uh, Attorney General's auditor, basically. Um, and here it lists like different uh, limitations that they're having and problems that they're having that are. Um, preventing them from reaching those uh, milestones. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting uh, just for like, you know, a shot in the dark uh, for a, a 57 page document. Um, I think there was another question about the summarization add on. Um, how does it handle um, like multiple documents, like let's say 20 um, of one type of document and one of another? Um, that is a good question. I think I'm going to, um, can I get your contact information? And I'm gonna ask Jim how that's handled and I can um, get you an answer after uh, the meeting, if that's okay. Awesome. All right. Um, two other add-ons um, that I think are pretty cool. And yeah, the summarization just finished. Um, but I already showed you the results from that one. Uh, the other two that I wanted to play around with that I thought were pretty, uh, particularly interesting, um, one that isn't publicly available yet, but will be shortly, um, is called Whisper. Um, you can provide it a uh, URL to a uh, audio file, um, MP3, MP4 um, format. Um, I think it's able to handle whatever, um, uh, MPEG-4 is able to parse out um, in Python, which is like, I, I think like 40 plus audio types. Um, but you provided a URL, um, you provided a level of uh, complexity. N note that um, the smaller sets, like tiny, base, small, are gonna be less accurate, but they're also gonna be quicker. Um, and then you provided a title. 
And what it does is it's going to provide you a transcription of uh, the audio file that you provided. Um, it can also be a video file, which I found to be interesting. Uh, so my use case um, was that, let me copy this one over. Um, and I actually tested it in other languages. So I tested this in, um, in Bosnian, um, which I expected it to do poorly on. Um, and was surprised at how good it did um, and how far um, these transcription, like artificial intelligence transcription services uh, have gone. Um, and like, if I set it to small, uh, it would only make like one mistake uh, for the two and a half minute audio transcription. Um, I'm just gonna let that run and then we'll get, uh, we'll wind back to when this one finishes. Um, in the meantime, we'll demo the scraper add-on as well. Um, I'm just gonna write this one, pausing in comedy. Um, a particular use case for the whisper add-on that I found to be useful. Um, one example that I have is um, a member of Lucy Parsons Labs got an uh, FBI file from the punk band uh, Black Flag. Um, basically, the FBI was monitoring Black Flag because of something they said during like a radio interview, offhand comment about someone that they'd worked with in the past. Um, and, you know, it was um, an audio file, and there's no current way natively to support audio files on Document Cloud. Uh, but what this is able to do is transform that uh, audio into um, a text based format so that you can run further analysis on it. Um, in particular, um, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the California reporting project has like something like hundreds of gigabytes of, um, uh, of, uh, video files right now and audio files. The use case for this, I presume is like, if you don't have the particular, um, time to review all those individual files, you can, you know, run whisper in the background, see what, um, pertinent, um, speech is detected, and then run some kind of further analysis using another tool, um, maybe like the summarize add-on, to try to glean information from a particular audio file or set of audio files um, if you don't have the resources to review each, each individual one. Um, yeah. Uh, Michael, can you share with me um, the, the link to the scraper demo? Uh, add-on that you wanted me to run while we let Whisper run in the background, because this is going to take a little while. And I'm not sure that I still have the uh, transcription from this one, but I know that it works. I think um, one of the one of the demos that we've been doing with the Scraper add-on is just Supreme Court, um, kind of the, the opinions and the, the slips that they release kind of throughout the course of a year. A lot of times you don't know exactly when those are going to be released. And so I think that's a, a good uh, use case for um, for the scraper demo. Totally. Um, to answer Louise's question, yes, it works in other languages. Uh, I've tried Russian as well. And it, um, I'm not a, a, I wouldn't consider myself by any measure a fluent speaker of Russian, but I consider that it did pretty decently um, based on like other transcriptions that I was able to derive from the text, uh, ones that were done uh, previously, like by a friend who's converting um, like Russian movies to English uh, subtitles. Um, to answer the question about how is it handled multiple languages spoken at the same time, that one I don't know because I haven't fed it information yet. I haven't done testing on um, like, let's say we have one English speaker, one Spanish speaker. I haven't tested um, that use case. Considering that um, you don't, um, differentiate which uh, language model you're using when you pick um, whether it's tiny, ba uh, tiny base, small, medium, large. Um, I'm assuming that it would uh, be able to uh, differentiate between multiple languages, but again, uh, untested, so I can't uh, fully speak to that one. Thank you for linking the um, OpenAI link, uh, Michael. I know it was briefly mentioned in the add-on description, but that's always good to have in the background too. Um, I'm just seeing multiple chat things. All right, let me go ahead and run the scraper add-on. Uh, 
Supreme Court opinions. Did you have a particular uh, keyword search that you usually use when you run the scraper add-on or just let it go? No, because it doesn't actually kind of, because uh, it, it, it's running on a cron job, I don't usually put keywords in there. Totally. It's good to, a good dimension sort of talk through what some of the options do. Um, yeah, you wanna take over on this one? Okay, sure. Uh, do you mind just scrolling a little bit up? Yep, totally. So with the scraper add-on, I think one of the things that we've seen a lot is sort of people, You maybe you're monitoring sort of a state agency that releases disclosures, or there's a reading room for an agency that you care about. What you can do is you can just kind of drop in a URL um, of any, any kind of website. And anytime there's newly uploaded documents to that page or two pages linked to from that page or two pages linked to from you know, two levels deep, um, the scraper can either run once and kind of download everything that's that's linked there, or you can set it to run on an hourly or daily basis. Um, and so that first thing is just drop in the URL there, and then you can optionally give, is it optional? Maybe you have to include a project title. Um, you can either put in a, one of your existing projects names or put in a, a brand new name. Um, and then you can also uh, push any grab documents to IPFS and Filecoin, uh, which is sort of a distributed storage network so that um, if you really wanna make sure that this document is preserved long-term, that, that helps with that. Um, and then down here, if you wanna get alerts on specific keywords, maybe you're only interested in documents that mention a company that you're following or mention police misconduct or something else like that, you can put in keywords and kind of get emailed alerts anytime any of those keywords are mentioned in some of the documents that you're following. Or if you click on the next tick box, you'll get a, an email alert anytime there's any new documents uploaded to that. So if you follow the Supreme Court in general, you might wanna get notification at any time there's a new filing. Um, other times you might want to just uh, get things that mention healthcare as an example. Um, and then you can set an optional crawl depth and that's, does it just look at that page or does it look at pages linked to from that page? Um, and so on. And then if your team uses Slack, um, you can also pipe those notifications right into a Slack channel um, so that, you know, you, you uh, and you can have that either directly message you if you set up the, the Slack uh, integration like that, or you can have it go to like a shared channel so that um, no matter who's on that day, they'll get notifications that, oh, you know, the, um, the state Supreme Court posted a new document, let's make sure we're on it and that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, you can just uh, define a schedule there. Um, if you run it one off, it'll just grab all of the documents it can find on that page. Uh, and if you set it on a schedule, it'll check back once an hour, once a day, or once a week, depending on, on your needs, um, back on that web page and just grab everything um, as, as new documents are, are loaded. There is a limit. I think it'll, it'll only capture a... a a hundred documents per run currently, just so that it, it doesn't um, time out. Uh, so that if there's over a hundred documents, it'll keep keep checking back until it's got them all. Um, but we found that that's usually enough to kind of capture the the interesting stuff. Totally, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think this is particularly useful. Um, it lowers the barrier of entry. A lot of people that I've communicated with. Um, local journalism agencies or activist groups even, um, they're interested in like consistently monitoring like new bills around privacy related issues or policing or something related to that on a government site. Uh, but they just don't have the resources to manually do that all the time. And also uh, there is a barrier of entry to implementing your own uh, web scraper, developing one on, on Python. So having one that's built into uh, document cloud is really powerful. Also, the fact that it can upload those uh, documents and preserve them in your document cloud account, which you can use other add-ons to uh, analyze with, I think that's really cool. Um, so I think like a lot of the theme uh, around uh, document cloud add-ons, in, in, in my opinion, is lowering the barrier of entry for um, people to use powerful um, analysis, scraping, um, modification technologies, uh, that you know programmers can use, uh, but not necessarily like uh, a small journalism group or a small activist group might be able to do um, without exhausting 
that one tech dude in the group or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to go ahead and dispatch it anyways. Uh, Whisper failed. That's interesting. We can look at that a little later. Um, but I went ahead and queued that. Um, this might be an interesting juncture to go ahead and bring up uh, where you can analyze why an add-on failed real quick. Help if I could spell. Maybe it'd be easier to just look up my clock. My clock organization. Whisper on. Options. So um, each add on, uh, as you're running um, the user interface on Document Cloud in particular, um, there are things happening in the background um, as a user that you're not necessarily privy to, but that you might uh, be interested in anyways, uh, in particular when we get a failure. Um, so in this case, uh, the Whisper add on failed. If I click on the individual add on, it actually shows me uh, the repository where uh, add on is located, which I should have done in the first place to get there. Um, if you go to actions, it'll show you each time the add-on was run and whether or not it was successful or had a failure. Um, in this case, this was the most recent one. If we can scooch that over. Uh, that was 10 minutes ago. So that was uh, the one that I just ran. Uh, if you click on the um, box here, you're actually able to see, um, usually it will give you a description of why the add-on um, didn't run. In this case, it doesn't provide me one, which goes to show that sometimes uh, live demos don't always work out. Um, <laughs> but usually um, it'll provide you like a code dump uh, where it'll show like where in particular uh, in the code it failed or if it timed out or something similar to that. To segue from there, um, did we have anything else to review on um, current currently rolled out add-ons and um, upcoming add-ons, Michael, uh, before I move on to kind of add-ons are underneath the hood? No, I think that that covers the, the ones, but there's currently about 20 public add-ons that you can browse and we'll be rolling out a, them fairly regularly. And so poke around, we have some that can extract data, others that extract, uh, somebody mentioned the tabula add-on um so there's there's a lot in there to kind of help you out yeah totally um the speaking of the tabula add-on um i'm currently working on um expanding on the tabula add-on so what the tabula add-on allows you to do is let's say a government agency provided you a pdf of a document that was clearly a spreadsheet at some point um let me see if i can pull one up in particular here I believe i do your public documents. Here's a good one. If you scroll through here, you'll see multiple tables within the document um, that were clearly at some point some kind of organized table structure or came from a spreadsheet, like these numbers, uh, property tax increments, so on and so forth. Um, you know, Copying and pasting doesn't always work. And if you got a really long document, like this one's 38 pages long, uh, it's laborious. Um, Tabula is a desktop software that allows you to um, basically click and drag over particular table structures and allows you to extract those tables from PDFs. Um, what the Tabula add-on does uh, is it allows you to use that um, Tabula desktop app without running it locally on your machine. But additionally, um, there's two modes to it. So uh, if I click on this, this is the one that I'm currently developing. Uh, you can run uh, the Tabula add-on with a template or without a template. What a template is, is if you're running the Tabula desktop app um, and you have like a set standard document, like you know that, um, this document always looks the same. The fields are always in the same location. They always kind of look similar. They're on the same page, so on and so forth. 
and you have 100 of those documents and you want to run them really quickly, you can develop a template and then run a template of one document and then run that template across you know, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 documents and have it run like that. Um, the tabular add-on that you all see on your document in cloud, um, and because this is not public yet, uh, is without a template. So it tries to guess in the document where the particular tables are, which sometimes is, is successful, sometimes isn't. Um, in this particular case for a document that I was trying to work on with um, uh, Civic Lab, it wasn't very su successful at picking out where the tables were on each page. But what I was able to do is develop a template using the desktop app, and then um, I expanded on the tabular add-on so that you can include your own spreadsheet. Um, I'll run that real quick so you can see what I mean by extracting tables. <laughs> and it'll run this against both of the documents I've selected. So I'll have that run in the background. Um, to segue a little bit, I'm going to dive into real quick um, what, what is an add-on anyways? Like, okay, um, there are the main document cloud features. Um, you know, I have projects. I can edit things. Um, I, can, I can add tags for documents. I can uh, make a description. I can click on a document and and redact things or annotate things or modify pages, rearrange stuff in the document. Uh, those are all features that are built into do document cloud, but add-ons are everything that tries to um, extend or expand on the main functionality of the document cloud user interface. Um, this is stuff that's been developed both by uh, people at Muckrock, but also third-party users, um, stuff that they've used in-house um, previously that um, they, they would consider that might be a useful tool for other organizations to be, have access to, um, and that uses um, the document cloud service. So um, yeah, you click an add-on and it works like that. Um, and then there's things happening on in the background that I'll expand on. Let's get to the tabular sp spreadsheet extraction and then I'll get into the presentation about uh, what is an add-on in the background. I'll show you the results for this one. It's able to pick out most of the information. It gets really good uh, once we get down to the money. So it's able to actually pick out uh, the numerical values. So uh, the folks at Civic Lab, what they were doing is they had 200 or 300 of these almost identical documents analyzing um, financial districts, uh, basically TIFFs in Chicago. And they were doing this manually. They were going page by page, document by document, and adding it into a master spreadsheet. Of course, that takes a lot of volunteers and a lot of hours to do manually. Um, but using something like a tabular add-on, I'm able to pull this information for every document that I run it against. And then um, you know, I can use the power of Excel to automate a lot of the, the manual labor that they were working with in the past. Um, now let's go ahead and step into what a document cloud add-on is in the background. Let's go ahead and slideshow this. And you'll see what I mean by uh, the stuff in the background in a second. So again, I mentioned um, the document cloud user interface has a lot of features that are really useful, annotating, redacting stuff, access control. You can decide whether or not you wanna share a document publicly or privately or with other members of your organization. Uh, you can do uh, cool things like have entity extraction. Um, you can modify PDFs, um, rearrange pages, um, rotate pages, so on and so forth. Um, but what if we wanted to do more than that? Um, we've shown you some things that you can do that are already more than that. Um, so the brilliant folks at Muckrock before me thought of this thing called add-ons, um, which is community developed open source extensions of the document cloud user interface. Uh, it allows us to build technologies in a collaborative way um, that uses the document cloud platform and really uh, has the benefits of all of the uh, wonderful libraries and uh, use, usability of the Python programming language. Um, 
you have you don't have to worry about uh, developing your own user interface. You don't have to uh, worry about uh, hosting your own server to run code against the document cloud uh, against document cloud using the document cloud API. You don't have to uh, worry about um, a lot of a lot of the things that developers get caught in. Um, the benefit of it is it uses something called GitHub Actions, which I kind of alluded to a little earlier and which we'll dive into a little bit more. Um, it, again, it leverages the power of the Python programming language um, and the document cloud um, Python wrapper for the document cloud API. Um, because this runs on GitHub, uh, you don't have to spin up your own server or run it locally from your machine, although you can test your add-ons locally. Um, and then I think one of the most powerful benefits of it, um, as we saw with the Whisper add-on, is you can see um, why things in particular fail, uh, whether it's a failed job or a successful job. You have access to the log information right there to be able to debug. Um, I found this to be a really uh, user-friendly development experience um, because you know, I can break something, I can see the immediate results after I've run it, and then I can go ahead and fix it. Um, there isn't a, the lag time between me modifying things about my add-on and me figuring out what is working and what is not um, is very short. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about what a document cloud add-on is. Again, we already ran through how to access an add-on and how to dispatch it. Behind the veil, um, so we looked at the actions portion of a document cloud add-on, but there's a little bit more. Um, I've linked to in this presentation, which I will also drop in the chat box, um, a link to the Hello World example add-on, which is a template that you can use to develop your own add-ons. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's a README file, which you just describe um, you know, what your add-on does, uh, if you've borrowed code from uh, other places, you know, you give them credit. Uh, you have some description about the usability of the add-on and how it works, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, again, I alluded a little bit to this, um, but this is kind of how it works under the hood. Uh, you have a, a YAML file, uh, a, configure, a configuration file for the user interface where you're able to define what the title is of your add-on, um, whether or not you want your add-on to run against uh, documents in a selected fashion, or whether or not you want it to run against a, a large query of documents. Uh, selected is limited to 25 documents versus a large query can be you know, thousands of documents. Although again, I, I, it can be difficult and it can be slow and you might uh, run a timeout if you run it against thousands of documents. Um, or you can, certain add-ons, they don't require to be run against documents at all. Um, like if you look at the add-on, uh, uh, the add-ons list, the uh, cloud import add-on, for example, doesn't require uh, running against any particular documents because it's just uploading to Document Cloud uh, from Google Drive, Dropbox, and so forth. Uh, then you define uh, properties. This would be um, things that the user has to input uh, in order for the add-on to work. Um, and then you list uh, required. Uh, these are things that, these are properties that the user must fill out in order for the add-on to run. And the dispatch button actually won't work if you don't include uh, that required uh, field. Uh, main.py, if you've ever written a Python program, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's where the bulk of your code goes. Um, there is um, a add-on class, uh, which you can read about in the Python Document Cloud Library, uh, which has some features um, built in. So you, uh, for the most part, you don't have to edit that uh, particular class. Uh, you would just add on um, usability, uh, like you would create a subclass of that particular add-on class and you would instantiate and then you would have it do something in main.py. Uh, in main.py, of course, you can use a plethora of Python libraries, whether that be you want to do your own uh, different form of OCR, uh, like we've been playing, a while, uh, playing around with uh, Amazon's uh, TextRack. Um, 
or if you want to use a third party API, um, like I've developed an add on that allows you to back up your document cloud documents to the Internet Archive, for example, and that uses the Internet Archive API. Or if you want to do some kind of file handling or nature, natural language processing, like the summarization add on, there's plenty of Python libraries out there uh, for you to use. Um, requirements.txt, that's pretty simple. Um, if you're using an external uh, library, uh, you should include it in requirements.txt so that um, basically when uh, GitHub Actions uh, sets up the local server for that run, uh, it includes that as, uh, as a um, package to install uh, when it's running the Python code. Uh, without it, you may run into an error of like, oh, uh, NLTK, which is the natural language processing, isn't installed. Or uh, for the Internet Archive one, if I didn't include it in requirements.txt, oh, you don't have Internet Archive uh, actually installed on the GitHub. Um, on that particular GitHub server. Uh, GitHub workflows, um, for the most part, are handled for you with a few exceptions. Um, the two big ones I've listed on this page. Um, a big one is timeout. So if you expect your add-on to be running on like, you know, hundreds or thousand documents or on a particularly large document, and it's doing some kind of complex analysis for you, uh, the default timeout is five minutes. Um, which is pretty low for some use cases. Uh, so for example, the Internet Archive export one, if I'm backing up like a project that's 100 documents, um, I want to make sure that I have enough time for that to actually be able to export. So I change the timeout to 60. Uh, the other thing um, that you add to your workflow uh, YAML file is uh, things like secrets. Secrets are basically uh, things that you don't want to explicitly state in your, in your main code. Um, things like a password, an API key, um, even sometimes a username or email. Uh, the reason why is it's open source. So if you publish you know, your username or email or password or API key on GitHub, it's in the commit history. Uh, so someone can look in there and gain, gain, have unauthorized access to your API key or what have you. So if you wanted to implement uh, secrets, there's two secrets, the token and the key, uh, and you're able to define, you have to go into GitHub and cr actually create a repository secret uh, to link this, um, but there are two different uh, secrets that you can link to. Um, but for the most part, you don't have to worry about um, editing the template workflow because uh, it's it works for most uh, add-ons. And then again, we went through actions a little bit earlier. Uh, it allows you to view uh, whether or not an add-on run failed or succeeded and what the statuses were, uh, where in the process it failed. Um, like if you didn't include something in requirements.txt, you might fail on build. Or um, if your code had you know, a syntax error, it's going to uh, fail on, upon run. Um, or if there's a timeout error, it might fail in the, the post job cleanup because uh, your add-on ran for too long. Um, yeah, it's pretty useful. Uh, again, inspecting failures, you go into the failure page and then you click on the individual uh, run and you're gonna actually able to see, um, I've linked the actual runs for these. Uh, so when I drop the presentation in, you'll be able to click on the individual uh, images and actually get to those pages. Um, but this one, for example, it tells me, um, Bucket name should be valid archive and identifiers. Um, this was a error um, because the Internet Archive has a very particular and unique way of naming their items. Um, and mine wasn't unique. So I had to edit my code to make sure that uh, when someone was uploading an item, uh, that that item had a unique name uh, so that I didn't get that error. Um, that could be trivially solved by adding something like a date timestamp or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, the end of this kind of portion of the presentation is just like linking to all of the open source add-ons that we already have out there. Um, some that we've already covered today, like Whisper, Summarization, Scraper, GPT-3, Tabula, some other ones that we didn't, like the Internet Archive export, um, and many more. Um, if you look on the Muckrock page, or if, again, if you, click on the individual add-on that you're running, 
you can always uh, view the source code for the add-on uh, right here. Let's see, um, I'm gonna check real quick if there's questions. Might also be a good time if you didn't write a question in there, if you just wanna unmute and ask your question live, that would be good too. Yes. Oh, I do see a question. Michael, do you, do you have an answer to how to delete a scheduled scrape? Yeah, did you, you didn't end up scheduling that scrape, did you? Um, do you have any cron job set up currently? No, I didn't. Okay, so um, if you go in, actually it might be worth just setting up, set up run real quick so we can show how to delete it. Okay. Um, but the short answer is, and you just put in like example.com or something because it won't actually run. Um, sure. And then just run an hourly schedule. So all of your um, scheduled well, look at that improved error handling. Great. Um, uh, now, if you go back to the scraper add-on, mm -hmm. it'll show you, say, show scheduled add-ons, and then you can click on them. And then if this one had been running, you can see all of its previous runs, uh, when it had worked, when it had failed, and that sort of thing. Since this one hasn't actually run, um, there's not a lot of data there, but you can just open back up the add-on, and then you can kind of move between the the ones and you can either modify them and, and save those modifications or uh, delete them entirely. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I th something I, th I didn't sorry. know, actually. If you, if you scroll down to the bottom, actually, like to, to cancel it, you need to uh, scroll down to the bottom. Uh, the run the run on a schedule there, you can you click on the hourly uh, disable and then save that. That will disable it. Very cool. Thank you, Mitch. No problem. Awesome. Any other questions? Oh. Nope, don't see anything else. Let's see. Anybody else have a live or uh, text-based question that they want to ask? Seeing none, I will, I will ask a question. And sure. how can people uh, contribute to the add-ons catalog? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So if you um, are interested in developing uh, an add-on, uh, whether or not you have, let's say I want to work on uh, extending the Whisper add-on in particular, I can always fork it on GitHub. Uh, that'll clone the repository to my local GitHub account. And then I can make edits. Um, and then if there are significant edits, I can make a pull request. Um, and you know, we can decide whether or not we want to include that in the main di main distribution of uh, the whisper add-on, or if you know they want to run it uh, individually. Let's say you're not working off of uh, uh, an add-on that already exists, but you want to make your own thing. Uh, you can use the template from the Hello World add-on. Let me pop back in there. Where's the so many tabs? Let's close some of these. Close, close, close. Where did my presentation go? Lovely. Or oh, wait, there it is. If I uh, wanted to make a brand new uh, add-on, for example, I could go to the Hello World add-on. Uh, it is the template add-on. Uh, so what you're able to do, let's see. There's uh, documentation on how to get started with your first add-on. Um, it's pretty in-depth. Um, there are some things uh, that will be changed shortly um, and amended to. Um, uh, if I'm actually logged in, it will uh, allow you to uh, click uh, use this template, uh, which allows you to basically make a copy of this in your uh, local GitHub account. And then you're able to add modifications um, 
as you want. And I understand, I just realized that there's a slight delay between my audio and the screen share. So I apologize for that. Um, but basically it would appear uh, right around here. Um, it'll show um, like use this template and it will basically copy over this um, template add-on. And then from there uh, you can make changes in uh, the YAML file to modify the user interface. You can add functionality in main.py. Uh, you can add which resources you need in the requirements.txt, uh, so on and so forth. Um, if you wanted to actually um, get your add-on added to the main site, um, you can either contact me or Mitch. Um, we'll do a code review, and um, then we can talk about uh, including it uh, on our site, like on our main site here. Uh, that's a that's a good thing. Uh, that's a good um, point to bring up. Uh, you can run add-ons uh, on your own uh, document cloud account uh, that aren't available to the general public. Uh, so, for example, like this tabula spreadsheet extraction tool, this is one that I made, but isn't actually the tabula add-on that you see uh, publicly. Uh, and I'll Maybe I'll have to search it. Let's see. While you're while you're searching, I'll ask two. I'll ask two questions. Jack, did your question get mm -hmm. answered in terms of add-ons that will do topic modeling? Um, and then, or I can follow up separately with that one. And then I know the other idea was, um, as was asked earlier in the chat, um, the question was about wanting to go ahead and, 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 and having ideas for add-ons, but not necessarily having technical expertise. Um, as Michael wrote in there, we're looking for feedback and ideas. That's the reason that we did this session. That's the reason we're, we're, we're asking folks to go ahead and ask questions or send us comments after this session or share with other people that might be interested. Yep. Uh, anything that allows us to go ahead and see any additional ideas and then see what else might be possible and perhaps connecting people. Yeah, and totally. Um, sorry that I just yeah. able to speak there, but basically, um, there was two different types of um, runs. One that's already merged into the, the main website, um, actually developed by someone else entirely, and then one that's locally run. Um, you basically have to have the same email account for your document cloud account and your GitHub account. And then there are instructions um, in that documentation that I showed earlier on the Hello World um, add-on that uh, shows you how to actually run your add-on on, on your document cloud account. Um, and then again, if you wanted it to be included in the main website, uh, you could ask one of us for a code review. Um, as for like feedback on add-ons, uh, we're thinking about including a feature uh, where after a run is finished, you can give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and then leave us feedback on an individual run. And then also um, we're always looking for ideas um, we have an add-on wish list that we keep track of. Uh, people have added to it uh, throughout the months. Um, and I always want to add more on there. Uh, it gives me more to do. I'm going to drop my... Uh, I, I, uh, I just dropped, email I just dropped our email addresses in the chat. Um, and I was going to say, that there are, are there any other questions? I know folks might have to run. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, Thank you, Andre. Seeing none, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. You have our email addresses. Um, if you don't grab it from here, you can easily grab it off the web. Off, you can at least grab mine off the website. Um, and we're more than happy to go ahead and speak with you and find new ways to go ahead and build out this functionality. Um, and we're just going our plan is to do a couple more of these and maybe. Yeah, one last thing before I. Go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to drop, I'm going to quietly drop the presentation link in here to give me one moment. And what we'll if there's also, any other questions? Yeah. And what we'll, and what we'll do is we'll go ahead and send out a link to, um, to the presentation once we have it uploaded and um, the video and any, and there's my contact information, things like that. Um, but it's good to see all of you today. Denise, I have not seen you in a long time. I don't know if you remember from our, from my days of being publisher, um, but, uh, and thanks everybody for attending. And um, if you have any other questions, let us know. And I will stop the recording too.